Today on Catch and Cook California, we're making stone bladed knives with nothing but rocks like these and pieces of obsidian just like these. So join us and keep the old ways alive. So we laid out this blanket. Um, we did that because we're both archeologists and it would be highly unethical for us to come out on the landscape, make a bunch of stone tools and leave behind the waste flakes or what we refer to as debitage. We don't wanna be leaving fake sites, you know, so we laid, laid this down. We'll carry everything out that we brought in. All right, I'm gonna try and work down this uh, fine grained volcanic that we found here um, and see if I can make a blade out of that. If it doesn't turn into a knife blade, then we'll switch over, use some obsidian. It's already carrying an edge so sharp that that's, it would work just fine right now as a cutting tool. And doing this too, you have the added benefit. Anytime you work this stuff down, I mean, it's amazing how many tools you're making basically. All these right here are flakes that are coming off the, the thing I'm working on, this, this blade that I'm trying to make. But all these can either be turned into arrowheads or they're tools in themselves right now. And I have very thick weather, but... Let's do it. Let's show them. Go. Crazy sharp. So, be careful. Basically, I've removed all these flakes along one face and you can see the cortex. This is the weathered exterior of the rock and this is actually one of the things we look for in order to know that it's going to respond well to flint napping are all these little circles, these half circles here. So these basically indicate that as it's tumbling and it's hitting rocks, it's creating little flakes inside, but that shows you that the rest of the rock is flakeable. So now I need to get rid of the cortex. What I've done is I've removed a series of flakes in one direction all along here to build up that 70 degree angle. Now I'll flip it over and I'm gonna start shooting flakes along this side to get rid of the cortex, thin it down and turn it into a knife blade. Oh, so sad. This is what we refer to as the oh break. Basically, I hit too far into the interior and it created a bending fracture. We find these archaeologically with the hammerstone in a pile of debitage that looks just like that. And you can just tell the person was like, ah, shit, and just got <laughs> up and walked away. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it out. And I'm going to show you how this works with glass. <laughs> got a good one? I went for broke and I kind of succeeded. So yeah, you can use the base of a bottle to make a stone tool, even though it's not stone, it's a glass tool, but a flaked, flint napped tool. So I'm gonna try and make my knife blade out of this glass bottle base. There's a lot of bottles learning how to do this. Mm -hmm. You can hear the sound is changing as I'm starting to thin down this edge. That also means but it's also much more brittle and much more likely to break. All right, so I've worked it all the way around. Now the platforms are built up so that I can start shooting on this face. So I'm going to abrade, again away from myself, or side to side, never toward myself. Just trimming everything up, sanding it down a little bit. This makes it safer to hold, and it makes it so that the flakes you remove are much bigger. Okay, flip it over. Now I'm going to start shooting flakes this way in theory. Whoa! That's like the third I've had. 
It's okay, we won't despair. It's still plenty big to make ourselves a nice little knife blade. In theory. <laughs> it's funny, we're it's actually good, really man. good at this, but yeah, like, <laughs> off day, man. <laughs> I'll show you some stuff we've made. <laughs> some, to <laughs> prove that we today. actually know what we're doing. <laughs> this is kind of ridiculous. Oh, God. All right. So I've built up that platform again. It was all 90 degrees here because of the break. So basically it was like that. And I just removed a whole series here. So now we got that 70 degree angle again. Again, still plenty big to make a knife lid. Flip it over and I'm starting to shoot flakes along this space. You can see like, nice big flakes coming off there. I'll also use the edge of the billet sometimes, and I find that gives a little bit more control. There are those that use antler for this, and you certainly can, um, but I often find when you're in an actual bushcraft situation where you need to actually improvise a knife from a piece of glass, looking for antler can take a while. And if you know how to do this with just a hammer stone, and a piece of glass you find on a river bar. And unfortunately, people are messing around all the time, leaving their garbage behind. But if you need it, you find a piece of glass and a rock, you can just use those two pieces and make yourself a fully functional knife blade. What the heck is going on? It's been a while. Is kind of weird. We used to flint nap all the time. <laughs> is it gone? Uh, it was looking really good and then I, uh, I don't know what I did there. How are we supposed to do this blindfolded if we're not even doing it right right now? <laughs> uh, we got it. <laughs> so it's not as easy as it looks. It looks like we're just banging rocks against glass and it's just making stuff but um, yeah take some finesse. Okay, you can see it's really taking shape now. Starting to get that characteristic flake scar pattern. And we'll keep working it down into a knife. Look at you. Did you just jinx me? I might have. <laughs> I think you might have. <laughs> I don't know why everything I make turns out looking like a crescent, I swear. <laughs> everything I make look like a chunk of nothing. <laughs> You know that's not true. Ah, uh, dude. No oh, man. <laughs> Just jumped it in half. Jinx. So yeah, it takes time. It takes practice. Not easy. You know, it's always a, a crapshoot. You you either end up with some really good stuff, and like this stuff is great. Like I'm not, you know, obviously I'm I'm messing up somewhere, but in the end, it's just practice, practice, practice. It's getting there though. Hey, look, I caught up to you. There you go. <laughs> you can start from a big piece and work it down, and you know, and that's good practice. I usually like doing that to warm up, but most of the stuff I actually make arrowheads, blades, whatever. Um, it's mostly flake based stuff. Like, honestly, like I usually core out something this size or this size, even or whatever, core it out, get a bunch of material. Um, a lot of these flakes and then I'll go in and pick good ones that I really like and I'll I'll sit there and pressure flake them or you know turn them into to something different. I actually started with uh, glass bottle bottoms and things like that to kind of practice and then um, yeah over time you just uh, get worse or better I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Hopefully better. Hopefully better. <laughs> So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking this little antler here, putting it on the edge where I've prepared the platform, and I'm just pushing off these little flakes. This is called pressure flaking. This is how you finish these bad boys off. It makes it nice and sharp, and it allows you to further refine the shape. Every once in a while, just shake that out. That way you don't hit it and have all that stuff bounce up into your face. Start to a, a knife blade, nice and straight, thin, 
it just came off a flake something like that all right so i finished and the last thing i'm going to do is i'm going to abrade the edges of the stem and the base with some sandstone and that makes it so that when we haft it to a handle we're not going to cut through our cordage and i'm going to make this side a little bit deeper so when i haft it i've got a little bit higher leading edge on this side for cutting but then i'm gonna to have to resharpen this a little bit i ground it already for what I was doing with the pressure flaking. So I'm gonna go through and take some more flakes off, get that edge real nice and sharp. But after I get this done, then um, yeah, it'll be ready to haft up and use. And uh, you pressure flake down like this and hold the piece in your fingers such, and kind of pressure flake out. Dude, that looks beautiful, man. And I like getting rid of these little corners just a little bit. Um, I've noticed that that cuts through the hafting when you actually get it hafted. So it, it'll have it'll have kind of a cut in it, but it'll it'll be kind of sloped out, so it doesn't have this really sharp angle to it when you actually are using the thing. Because this stuff's so sharp, if you hafted this with a sharp edge on it, anytime you because a little bit of wiggle, I and mean, we're trying to keep it as solid as possible, but any any movement in that over time will actually cut your binding and then. It's kind of useless at that point. And then there it is. Nice, man. Good work. So what I'm doing right now is called grooving and snapping. It's a great way to use stone tools because you're obviously not going to cut all the way through. But all you got to do is basically compromise the sapwood on the outside all the way around. And we see this archaeologically. People use the same method for cutting bone, antler, all that kind of stuff. And then basically you just put a little tension in a couple of directions and off it comes. Ooh. Mm. Put some dirt on it. <laughs> Good as new. Well, maybe no, not. Maybe not. <laughs> there you go. Blood, sweat, and tears. No tears. No tears. I always end up rubbing a little blood into each bow that I make. Knife handle. It makes it personal, you know? Yeah, no one wants to touch it after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buddy. You got it. Awesome possum. Yeah. I would grab some of the meat. Out. Damn, dude. Okay. You got some more, you got some more here. Careful. Oh, that's hot. Beauty. All right, that barely worked. Oh man, that's awesome. Dude, that jute <laughs> that works, huh? That jute is amazing. Barely worked, man. I lost it. Both embers, like one fell off, like <laughs> everything was working against that. So I was like, oh no. So we're keeping a small fire, totally keeping it contained. We're using mule fat. It grows in a, a whole lot of these little like uh, alluvial areas, these creek channels. It grows along with the willow. And mule fat, in our experience, seems to burn pretty much smokeless, which is awesome. We don't want a big fire because California has absolutely been ravaged by wildfires and that's also why we're building our fire out here where there's almost no vegetation. Keeping it small, all we need to do is melt that pitch, and we've got our water here just in case something was to get out of hand. So ochre and uh, rabbit turds work great as binders. Basically, kind of like you use tempera in pottery. It just allows it to be a little more flexible, a little bit stronger, but we really gotta pulverize this down. We don't want big chunks in there. 
And if you dig the mortar and pestle, which I certainly hope you do, this thing took 16 hours, eight hours for the pestle, eight hours for the little pigment mortar. We make bigger ones for acorn and stuff like that. And we will show you in coming videos just how we were able to do that. All stone tools the old way. All right, so we got a nice mix here, ochre and rabbit droppings. Uh, just remember, if you're gonna use your mortar and pestle for rabbit droppings, don't put your acorn in there. <laughs> Let's add that in. This is gonna be our binder. It's gonna allow for a nice, strong, flexible glue. Get a little nasty rabbit <laughs> glue. <laughs> this stuff is gonna work great though. Really is truly impressive. I'm gonna set this into my knife handle like that. And then this is the trick. You can only wet your hand once when you're working with rabbit sh but check it out. Put a little spit on there. That keeps the glue from sticking to your hand, which is insanely important because this stuff is basically napalm. Okay, so that is now glued into place. And now we're gonna reinforce this. We're gonna reheat it, and then we're gonna reinforce it with some sinew, and then we're gonna wrap the handle with Thule cordage. So we stripped our sinew, pounded it out, stripped it, and then soaked it in the water in the abalone shell before we used it, so it's nice and supple right now. But it needs to be wet. If you don't wet your sinew, it is not gonna bind up correctly. So what you do is we're just gonna wrap it around to reinforce it. You don't even really need any knots for this because sinew will bind to itself. And remember, sinew is, is tendon, animal tendon. So we got this, this is from white-tailed deer, um, but you can use sinew from pretty much any animal. You'll find it along their, their forelegs there and you'll find it along their back strap. So I'm just gonna bind it over and I'm not using any knots on this because I'm gonna coat it back over with glue again. And it really just doesn't matter. When it dries, it's like shrink wrap. It just, boom, tightens up sinew hafted glass bladed knife you can see it's got a little curve to it it isn't perfect but you know what neither am i <laughs> i'm just gonna gob it on real good oh yeah sweet nice dude nice dude, that's looking sweet man That's a nice little blade you made there, man. Not too bad, huh? No, dude, nice little bite face. All right, so this is the last of the glue. We're just gonna bind and coat over the sinew. That way it's all solid, and this also makes it watertight. I will say that the last thing that we do as archeologists <clears throat> that do this experimental archeology span stuff and do a lot of bushcrafting, the last thing that we do is we'll incise the date using a diamond bit on a dremel tool and size the date into the the biface itself that way if we're we were to lose it it won't be confused with prehistoric specimens okay so finally we got to test these because hey if they don't work then what was all the investment for we decided we need to cut some of these bad boys whoa that's a praying mantis <laughs> dude i didn't even see him hey buddy Whoa, like that's awesome, dude. Sorry, bud, I didn't mean to cut your home. We'll put you on another mule fat somewhere else. The final test. Thule wrapped handle, super comfortable. I think we're gonna start wrapping our bows with this stuff. It's really, really nice and actually pretty durable. But we'll see how this glass blade does harvesting some mule fat. Mule fat is awesome for friction fire spindles, makes a beautiful smokeless fire. And it also makes great arrows. And since we're getting ready for deer season, we decided that we're gonna need to cut some arrow shafts. And obviously you could just snap these, but we're just testing the knives just to make it. A little score and snap action. Remember this is glass, so I don't wanna to put too much pressure on it, but I just wanna make sure that it actually works, which it totally does. Look at those edges, still super sharp. And when they wear out, then we'll just pressure flake them again, get them nice and strong, and be ready to rock. In the meantime, we're making some arrows. 
Today on Catch and Cook California. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>